Um, and welcome, everyone. This is, I believe, our 18th uh, installment of the online Spintronic seminar series. Um, I'm happy to introduce Professor Sergey Urajdin, who will be our speaker today. Professor Urajdin received uh, his PhD in uh, uh, 2002 from Michigan State University. Uh, interestingly, his PhD work included the discovery of surface states in narrow gap semiconductors that later became known as topological insulators. He then had a postdoctoral appointment at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, then in 2005, he joined the physics department of West Virginia University. And then uh, six years later, in 2011, he moved to Emory University, where he was promoted to a full professor in 2016, and he's still he's still there. Um, among other things, uh, uh, Sergey received an NSF Career Award in 2007, and a Cottrell Scholar Award from the Research Corporation in 2008. Uh, his research uh, focuses mainly on nanomagnetism, electronic control of magnetic systems, and electron spin physics. So please welcome Professor Rajdan. All right. Kirill, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so uh, today I'll talk about magnetization dynamics and waves uh, generated by spin current. Before I uh, start my talk, I would like to acknowledge uh, the contributions from my collaborators at Emory University, uh, University of Münster in Germany, uh, who did basically all the measurements I'll be, uh, I'll be presenting today, and also our collaborators at the Colorado State University, and also uh, the support uh, from several funding agencies listed here on my cover page. So the motivation for the work that I'll be presenting uh, comes from the idea of optical computing. Optical photon frequency is about 10 to the 15 hertz. That's up to six orders of magnitude higher uh, than the typical clock, clock speeds in modern electronic uh, uh, computers. And this can potentially provide an unprecedented opportunity uh, for a dramatic enhancement of computation speed. However, uh, the wavelength of optical photons of about 500 nanometers uh, represents a bottleneck uh, for, the, for the scaling down of optical computing based on free space light, and also free uh, space photons don't interact. And interactions uh, are basically prerequisite uh, for the implementation of logic operations. One of the possible solutions to these limitations is uh, to hybridize light with electronic oscillations uh, in materials uh, resulting in the formation of plasmons. So uh, the wavelength of plasmons is reduced by the hybridization, allowing uh, downscaling to nanoscale. The nonlinearity is, uh, of plasmons is naturally facilitated by electronic transitions. However, plasmons are quite generally lossy. That makes it difficult to implement energy efficient computing uh, with plasmons. Another possibility that will be the focus of my talk is to hybridize light with, uh, with spins in magnetic materials, resulting in the formation of magnetic polaritons that are also known as, known as spin waves, and their quanta are called a magnets. And this gives rise to the name of the field that is pursuing this direction of research. It's, uh, it's called magnonics, or the nanoscale version is nanomagnonics. So among the advantages are the possibility to control the wavelength down to nanoscale by using uh, magnetic fields and also by tuning the magnetic properties of the materials. And uh, naturally, it turns out that spin waves are uh, very nonlinear, uh, making it easy to implement logic operations. So to develop magnonics, what we need to do is develop efficient methods for the local generation of spin waves, or hopefully eventually individual magnons at nanoscale, uh, their manipulation for logical operations, and also their detection. So in this direction, a significant amount of progress has been made in the recent years. I should just mention, I will just mention uh, that it was demonstrated that one can efficiently focus spin waves, uh, one can do diffraction, uh, uh, spin waves can form self-collimated caustic beams, and there are many other effects that were demonstrated in this in many papers 
I listed just some of them that can be potentially used for efficient manipulation of spin waves. Proof of principle practical devices have been also demonstrated. Among them are a magnon a transistor, magnon amplifier, and also magnon based logic. However, in all of these demonstrations, the spin waves were generated by external microwave sources. And of course, this is not practical for the implementation of real devices. So the question is, is it possible to achieve coherent spin wave generation at nanoscale without using external microwave sources? And this is the question that will be addressed in my talk. So uh, a tentative answer to this question was given more than 20 years ago by Slanchevsky and Berger, who showed that when spin current inject is injected into a magnetic system, then it exerts a torque called spin torque on the magnetization. And this torque uh, can, in, in a suitable geometry, opposed, oppose the damping torque. And so when, uh, when the damping is completely compensated by the spin torque, then magnetization can start to exhibit uh, a spontaneous dynamics or change its configuration. So these predictions were confirmed in a multitude of experiments. I'm just showing some of the pioneering or and, uh, most prominent works, which showed that the spin torque can be used to reverse the magnetization in, magne in magnetic multilayers but also by using a uh, spin orbit torque due to the spin hole and or rush by effect. Uh, this is a more recent direction. And also the uh, spin torque was shown to be able to change the dynamical properties as is illustrated here of uh, magnetic materials and uh, coherent dynamical states. So the question now is whether these effects can be utilized for the generation of coherent spin waves. So um, to facilitate uh, the discussion and analysis of the data that I'll show later in my talk, I would like to briefly outline the expectation for the effects of spin torque at finite temperatures. And let me choose a slightly unusual route in terms of magnets. Let's consider magnetization or magnetic moment represented by this vector here, or equivalently a spin, processing around the magnetic field at some angle theta. This dynamics can be described by the Wanda Lipschitz, gilbert Slanchevsky, or LLG equation, which at a zero temperature contains three terms. The Larmor precession around the magnetic field, Landau damping, or one can also use Gilbert damping, and uh, the spin torque. What we can do now is convert the LLGS equation into magnon language. So the magnon population can be simply related to the angle theta of the magnetization precession, which at small angles is, is just a quadratic uh, relationship. So now we can take Landau damping, this cross product, and rewrite it in terms of the angle theta of the precession. So what we obtain is the rate of change of the angle is proportional to the angle and now we can convert that into the magnum language, which will give us the following equation. The rate of change of the magnum population is some constant uh, multiplied by the magnum population. This is nothing else but the relaxation time approximation for the magnum population with some characteristic relaxation time that is dependent on the Gilbert damping constant, the magnetic field and uh, their magnetic uh, ratio. Now, what this allows us is to now formulate what we expect to happen at finite temperature. Namely, uh, according to this equation, the magnum population will relax at zero temperature towards zero. Now at finite temperature, the magnum population should relax to its equilibrium population and not. And so we can replace this relaxation time approximation with the expression that we expect uh, to be to, uh, uh, to be correct at finite temperature, where n naught is, of course, given by the Bose-Einstein distribution. Similarly, we can write uh, the spin torque term as a rate equation uh, for the magnum population. Now, when we put all of them together, uh, we can now reformulate landau lipschitz gilberts lanchevsky equation as just the kinetic rate equation for the magnum population that contains contributions from the spin torque and from damping. 
Uh, but now this whole procedure allowed me to reformulate this equation without using Langevin kind of more complicated analysis for finite temperature. Now, for example, if you consider stationary state when the rate of change is zero, we obtain this equation. The population of magnons is equal to the equilibrium population divided by a linear function of uh, the spin current uh, scaled by the critical current. You see at the critical current, the denominator becomes equal to zero, this expression diverges. At subcritical current, what this equation predicts is that the spin torque enhances uh, magnetic fluctuations. And this will be important for the understanding of the data uh, obtained at finite temperatures that I, uh, I will show to you next. So the technique uh, that was used in our work is microfocused brilliant light spectroscopy. All of these measurements were performed uh, by my collaborators in Germany. The mechanism of BLS is an elastic scattering of light by magnetic excitations, by magnets in the material, resulting in the shift of the uh, scattered light frequency that is, uh, that is simply given by the frequency of the excitations. We can now analyze the scattered light to determine uh, the spectral distributions, distribution of excitations in the magnetic material. In particular, the BLS intensity can be expressed as a product of the measurement sensitivity multiplied by the spectral density of magnets. So this is a spectroscopic technique that allows us to analyze the spectral distribution of the dynamic, dynamics and magnetic materials. Now in micro BLS version, the, uh, the light is focused in a diffraction limited spot and it's scanned over the surface of the sample. This allows one to also obtain the spatial distribution of the dynamical states. Here I'm showing a typical BLS spectrum um, uh, for a five nanometer thick permalloy film. You see the spectrum is a relatively narrow peak centered at the ferromagnetic resonant frequency, resonance frequency. So the mechanism of the formation of this, of this spectrum is the following. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the max, uh, there is a maximum wave vector of spin waves accessible to, to BLS that is uh, determined by the momentum conservation in this inelastic scattering process to be just twice the momentum of light. And this maximum momentum is quite small. So the sensitivity is limited to the spin wave states close to the center of the brilliant zone. And as a consequence, the BLS peak uh, can be thought of as basically a uh, fMR that is just slightly broadened by the fact that uh, BLS is also sensitive to finite uh, momentum uh, spin wave states. So now I can uh, introduce uh, a simple experiment that we performed quite a few years ago just to give us an idea of how this technique works and what are the challenges one encounters in trying uh, to achieve uh, coherent dynamical states and spin wave generation in magnetic systems. So this experimental configuration is quite simple. We had, uh, we had a platinum stiff uh, uh, spin orbit torque in the platinum, uh, uh, spin hole effect in platinum resulted in the injection of spin current into uh, a permalloy disk. Um, and uh, this spin current produced spin torque. This resulted in the modulation, modification of the fluctuation spectrum as shown here. So for one direction of current, the fluctuation intensity was suppressed as compared to the zero current spectrum. And uh, at, uh, for another current direction, it was dramatically enhanced. Notice that this spectra here are multiplied by a factor of five. This is of course qualitatively consistent with the predictions of, of spin torque theory. According to this theory, we can write one over the uh, magnum population, current dependent magnum population is proportional uh, to the current scaled by the critical current. Now, if you plot this inverse magnum population, which is just the same as the inverse intensity of the BLS uh, spectrum. Indeed, what we see is a linear dependence on current over a very uh, wide range of current. If we extrapolate this linear dependence to zero, 
that's the point where we expect uh, that's the value of the current uh, equal to the critical current at which we expect that the fluctuation intensity diverges and we should observe an onset of spontaneous uh, dynamics. However, we can see that this doesn't happen. Instead, the fluctuation uh, intensity saturates uh, without ever diverging. So what happens here? An insight was provided by time domain measurements shown here. At a current below the saturation in the linear regime at minus 25 milliamps, what we see after the onset of a current pulse at time equal to zero, this is the onset of the current pulse. The intensity of fluctuations abruptly jumps and then continues to increase. However, what we see at current uh, above the saturation, minus 30 milliamps, that's here. The intensity also abruptly jumps initially at the onset of the current pulse, but then it starts to decrease. And you notice that this decrease is quite slow compared to the initial jump. So what this implies is that in this saturation regime, there is a new process that prevents an increase of, uh, of intensity of fluctuations and uh, an onset of other oscillation. And this process is quite slow. So uh, this, from this, we infer that the mechanism uh, that, that results in the saturation of fluctuation is nonlinear interaction among many dynamical modes that are simultaneously excited by the spin current. So the question is whether it's possible to overcome these nonlinear damping effects and achieve uh, spontaneous coherent dynamics. So one of the ways in which we were able to achieve this uh, was by utilizing mode selective, uh, mode selective damping. And here is the idea. So what we did was uh, to take two sharp metallic electrodes on top of a platinum permal bilayer which were used uh, for the spin current injection just in this region in the center between the two electrodes. So magnets are generated in this region and then magnets with finite group velocity can escape from this region. And now when we look at this generic spectrum of magnets, finite group velocity means uh, that the derivative of frequency with respect to the wave vector is finite here and here. However, there is a mode at the bottom of the spectrum where df dk is equal to zero and as a consequence, the group velocity of the magnet at the bottom of the spectrum is equal to zero. So this magnet will not escape from this region and therefore uh, it can be selectively enhanced by the, its population can be selectively enhanced by the effects of spin current while the populations of other modes uh, can be suppressed in this region by this kind of evaporative cooling. Uh, which is expected to, uh, to, to allow us to avoid nonlinear magnet interactions. And indeed, the uh, measurements that are summarized here show that we are able to achieve, uh, uh, to avoid nonlinear suppression and achieve spontaneous coherent magnetization dynamics as signified. So you can see here, as the current is increased, the fluctuation intensity increases, and then we observe uh, an abrupt onset of this sharp uh, large intensity peak that signifies coherent, um, coherent auto oscillation. So there have been quite a few other devices that were proposed and implemented that also achieved coherent uh, spin current induced dynamical states. Among those devices are nanoconstriction spin hole, uh, device called nanoconstriction spin hole nano oscillator that consisted of, in this case, platinum permalloy bilayer with a bow type kind of shaped notch fabricated here, uh, uh, resulting in a local enhancement, uh, local spin current injection, mostly in this region, and also this enabled evaporation, evaporative cooling uh, of magnets by, by their escape into the surrounding extended magnetic film. Another uh, device that was, uh, was shown to be capable of coherent magnetization spin current induced magnetization dynamics is, uh, is a point contact driven by non-local spin injection. I won't dwell on it here, a schematic is uh, shown here, and you can refer to this paper 
uh, for details. And of course, there is a much older kind of design that is based on the traditional magnetic multilayer nanopillar fabricated uh, on top of an extended magnetic film. I should also mention that these are, these are devices that, uh, that achieved coherent uh, magnetization dynamics in extended magnetic films. But there have been also many demonstrations of, uh, of devices uh, that were based on confined magnetic systems. I'm listing some of them, nanodot, the SHNO nanowire, YIG based and SHNO domain wall, uh, spin hole nano oscillator and uh, knowledge nanowire. Perhaps I, I, I omitted some of them inadvertently because there are quite a few uh, by now uh, such devices demonstrated. But now I won't focus on the confined magnetic systems because uh, the, our goal is to understand whether we are able to generate coherent spin waves, which naturally is pursued in extended magnetic systems. So now the question is, we have achieved coherent magnetization dynamics in a number of different device geometries. Can these systems generate coherent spin waves? And the answer to this question can be provide, we, we can obtain by looking uh, again at the, at the BLS spectra and also at the spatial maps. So here I'm showing you spectra for four different types of spin hole nano oscillators. Planar point contact, uh, nanoconstriction, uh, multilayer, and also non-local spin injection point contact. In all of these devices, what we'll see is that the outer oscillation frequency, this here, this is our oscillation for this device. This is our oscillation here, and this outer oscillation peak here. They all lie below the thermal fluctuation peak. This is the thermal fluctuation peak that is enhanced by the spin term. This is the thermal fluctuation peak here that is great uh, in, uh, in, in these plots. So the, again, the thermal fluctuation peak is, uh, is centered at the ferromagnetic resonant frequency what this means is that the out oscillation frequency is below the lowest frequency of spin waves in the magnetic system. And as a consequence, it's not expected to be able to emit spin waves. And indeed, when we look at the spatial BLS maps, in all of these cases, the out oscillation is a localized spot. So the first order answer to the question that I posed is that even though one can now relatively easily achieve uh, coherent dynamics driven by, by, by spin torque. It turns out that uh, the generation of spin, wa spin waves by these dynamics is, does not naturally occur. So one can say, of course, in all of the systems, the spin current injection was local. So it was, it was in, the, in the very small region uh, of the magnetic system. So what happens if you start increasing the size of this region? So one of the, uh, experiments that gives uh, an idea of what can happen is shown here. So what we took here is, uh, is uh, a planar point contact uh, oscillator that I have shown to you before. And instead of using two sharp electrodes, uh, we made the gap between these electrodes very wide, almost two micrometers wide. Uh, and now what we see is at the critical current uh, there is an onset of outer oscillation just below the FMR frequency. So uh, in fact, the reason that it's slightly below FMR is, is quite trivial. It's, it's, it's the Ersted field of the electrical current that is applied to the device. So in principle, one can say that this dynamical mode with some engineering could be used uh, for the generation of spin waves. However, as we start increasing the current even a little bit, so here from, from 30, from the onset at about 30 milliamps to 33 milliamps, we see a, ra a rapid onset of a secondary dynamical mode at a much smaller frequency. So this mode does not, this, this, this frequency does not belong to the spectrum and therefore it's of course localized. It cannot emit spin waves. What is interesting is that the time domain evolution of these modes is quite different. You can see here, uh, you can see here spectra for three different times after the onset of the current pulse, 25, 50, and 100 nanoseconds. And in the beginning, only the high frequency mode appears. As time goes by, the intensity of this mode increases, but then 
the second mode at much lower frequency appears and quickly takes over, becomes more, uh, significantly larger than the primary mode. You can see uh, these results also summarized in this plot of the dependence of peak intensity on uh, time after the onset of the current pulse. So what this means basically is that this high frequency dynamics that is stabilized by this extended geometry of, of, of the structure is, is not stable and it essentially collapses into this, uh, this low frequency, uh, low frequency mode. What is the mechanism of this phenomenon? So one of the ways, uh, so this mechanism was, was first proposed by Slavin de Tibrikevich in 2005. And one of the ways, uh, simple ways to introduce it is let's consider um, magnetization precession around the effective magnetic field characterized by the oscillating X and Y components perpendicular to the field. And now let's say that, uh, let's say that the damping is uh, compensated by spin torque and we don't need to worry about them. So all we need to consider in analyzing magnetization dynamics is Larmor precession around the effective magnetic field. And also if these dynamics are inhomogeneous, the effect of exchange stiffness written here. So now we can transform this dynamical equation by using complex amplitude, which is a superposition of the X and Y components of the magnetization. And then this equation becomes essentially Schrodinger equation for this complex amplitude with the effective field playing the role of potential and the effect of exchange stiffness playing the role of the kinetic energy. And we can now recall that the effective field includes not only the applied external field, but also the demagnetizing field, the effect of the demagnetizing field of the magnetic system itself. Here, uh, to lowest order, we can write this effect as the amplitude squared of the oscillation multiplied by the coefficient of nonlinearity. And for the in-plane magnetized systems, this coefficient of nonlinearity is negative. So what does it mean? What this means is if you have, as I show here schematically, if you have a region uh, in the magnetic system where the amplitude becomes large, this lowers the effective field locally. And as a consequence, it will locally lower the, that creates an effective potential well, because remember the, the, uh, the effective field plays the role of the potential. And so then what you get is a localized state, as we all know from, from the basic quantum mechanics, you get a localized uh, state with frequency below the spin wave spectrum. And so this state can be described as a, as a self-localized standing spin wave soliton or equivalently a spin wave bullet. So there is an, un, an intrinsic nonlinear mechanism in in-plane magnetized magnetic systems that results in localized uh, dynamical states driven by the spin current. So the next question is, is it possible to use these dynamical states to generate coherent propagating spin waves. Uh, well, for a pla planar film, it doesn't seem to be possible, right? Because, uh, because the frequency of the states are, is below the spectrum. So one can be clever then and modify the spectrum of the magnetic film. For example, as follows. In this experiment, uh, we took um, a point contact uh, mul magnetic multilayer non-contact oscillator and then we patterned uh, the magnetic film to include, uh, to include a magnetic strip with a larger thickness than the surrounding magnetic film. The effect of this elevated uh, uh, region is the following. So there is a demagnetizing, demagnetizing field created by the edges of, of this st strip that opposes the external magnetic field. And this results in the lowering of the magnetic spectrum in the strip as compared to the surrounding magnetic film. So now we have the following situation. Let's say we have uh, some spectral range of magnetization oscillations, which uh, lies below the spectrum of spin waves in uh, the magnetic, unpatterned magnetic film. 
However, by using this kind of uh, demagnetizing effect, we have locally lowered the spectrum of spin wave modes in this magnetic wave guide. And so now uh, there are propagating spin waves in the waveguide at the frequency of the other oscillation. And indeed, our experiments shown here demonstrated that uh, this approach allows one to emit spin waves into the waveguide, but notice there is no emission in the surrounding magnetic film that is consistent uh, with, this, with this picture. So we have uh, recently extended these ideas uh, to spin orbit torques. So the, the, the configuration here is the following. We, we took a permalloy platinum by layer patterned into a strip with a notch with reduced thickness of the magnetic film in this small uh, region. The demagnetizing, the demagnetizing field is larger in this region than in the region of the notch. What this means is when we apply electrical current and induce, uh, induce, spin, uh, induce uh, spin torque in, uh, and, and as a consequence our oscillation in this region, this frequency of this other oscillation can be higher than this frequencies of spin wave modes in the regions with the larger demagnetizing effects, and that allows spin wave emission, as was demonstrated by, uh, by mapping shown here. What is one of the substantial advantages of, advantages of uh, spin orbit torques is that they can be exerted over extended regions. In particular, in this um, uh, geometry, spin torque is exerted not only in this active region, but also over the whole length of this strip uh, into which the spin waves are emitted. So the effect of this spin orbit torque is to reduce the effective damping. And as a consequence, one can expect that the propagation of spin waves, propagation length of spin waves can be enhanced. And indeed, this is what we saw in our experiment. So uh, this plot compares the experimentally observed uh, propagation length of the emitted spin waves as a function of applied current with the simulations. Uh, but the simulations were performed without accounting for the enhancement of spin wave propagation by the spin orbit torque effects. And what we can see is this is one of the rare cases when the experiment is better than the uh, the calculations by up to uh, the enhancement of spin wave propagation length is by up to a factor of three um, over the current range that was tested. Now, in all of these experiments that I have shown to you that enabled generation of propagating spin waves, the magnetic materials are actually patterned. So if one wants to create reconfigurable magnetic devices with flexibility of, uh, of the direction and configuration of spin wave emission, one needs to figure out how to do that for just plain extended magnetic films. And so the question now is, is it possible to generate, um, generate those spin waves in just planar films or equivalent, is it possible to generate coherent dynamical states by spin current in extended magnetic regions. The first kind of preliminary answer to this question that I gave in the very beginning of my talk is it looks like it's impossible because of the nonlinear uh, damping effects. So if one wants to solve this problem, we need to understand what these effects are and try to eliminate them. So our hypothesis was that the mechanism of nonlinear suppression of spin current induced fluctuations is a parametric, uh, is non resonant parametric pumping. And let me explain to you what we mean by this. So, if you consider just a generic uh, magnetic film like permalloy with negligible magnetic anisotropy, uh, this magnetic, uh, the magnetization dynamics shown here is elliptical because of the demagnetizing effects. So there is demagnetizing field that is produced by the magnetization oscillations that pull the magnetization towards the film plane. As a result, the precession trajectory is elliptical 
And now if you consider the projection of the magnetization on the equilibrium direction, it will now oscillate as shown here at the frequency equal to twice the frequency of the magnetization precession. So we can now think about, for example, the Kittel formula describing the frequencies of uh, different spin wave modes throughout the magnetic spectrum. Uh, in that formula, which I am not showing here, um, the, the frequency depends on the equilibrium, uh, on the, on, on the equilibrium uh, magnetization. So now if you have large amplitude of precession, you can, you can see that the oscillation of the projection of the magnetization on this equilibrium direction will result in the modulation, periodic modulation of the frequencies of all the spin wave modes in the magnetic system. And that will result in their pumping, their parametric pumping. Um, so if this hypothesis is correct, then nonlinear uh, damping can be eliminated by uh, if the magnetization precession trajectory is circular. And this can be achieved by compensating the demagnetizing effects um, by perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And so uh, there has been a lot of research in recent years on uh, various magnetic materials with controllable uh, anisotropies. One of the uh, one of the investigated materials is uh, cobalt nickel multilayers, and this is what we use for our study to. To, to analyze this, uh, these effects. So the structure that we, have, uh, that we have studied is a platinum uh, cobalt nickel trilayer with the thicknesses of cobalt and nickel adjusted so that the total thickness is five nanometers, just like in most of the experiments I, I have shown to you um, uh, so far. And the relative thicknesses of cobalt and nickel are adjusted so that the perpendicular anisotropy is precisely, precisely compensates the demagnetizing effects. And so uh, the experiments was, uh, uh, were performed with the structure geometry that is very similar to, to what I have shown to you before. It's just a platinum strip with either cobalt nickel by layer or permalo as a controlled sample patterned into, into a microscopic disc fabricated on top. And so what we saw is uh, as before, for permalloy, as the current is increased, the fluctuation intensity increases and then it becomes saturated and uh, the intensity starts to actually decrease because of the nonlinear effects that I have described to you before. However, for cobalt nickel, uh, we see a qualitatively different picture. So the fluctuation intensity increases and then instead of saturating it abruptly, it abruptly jumps uh, at the critical current signifying the onset of uh, coherent dynamics now achieved in the microscopic magnetic region, not by local spin current interaction. And the, the fact that we have been able to eliminate nonlinear damping is further confirmed by time domain measurements uh, illustrated here. So for permala, we see again an abrupt increase of fluctuation intensity and then there's slow decrease due to the nonlinear damping effects. For cobalt nickel, we see a monotonic increase of intensity. So this nonlinear uh, magnet interactions have been eliminated. Uh, these conclusions and the mechanism uh, that I have, uh, have, I have presented to you were also supported by micromagnetic simulations. So what we did was uh, to take just, uh, just a magnetic film uh, or magnetic system that, uh, that simulates cobalt nickel or permalloy uh, and at the onset start with, the, with the just a ferromagnetic resonant precession and then look at the dynamics of the system while neglecting the Gilbert damping effects to simplify the analysis. So we are interested not in, uh, in, uh, in relaxation related to Gilbert damping, but rather in relaxation that is associated with nonlinear magnetic interactions. And so uh, what we see, for example, at zero temperature, uh, the maximum X component, per, that is per component perpendicular to the equilibrium magnetization um, direction 
of both cobalt and nickel is independent of time. So it doesn't change with time. So uh, the oscillation continues essentially indefinitely. That's at zero temperature. Now at finite temperature, we observe qualitatively different behaviors. So for cobalt nickel, again, there is no, uh, there is no decrease within time, but for permala, we see an abrupt uh, rapid decrease of oscillation frequency above certain time. And so these this results are actually consistent with the parametric mechanism uh, of, the, of the relaxation that I have proposed. Um, why? Because uh, the parametric, parametric mechanism requires uh, a finite population of pumped modes. At zero temperature, the populations of all the modes except for the FMI that was excited in the simulations are zero. And so there is no parametric pumping. At finite temperatures, there are finite populations of thermal populations of all the magnetic modes that enable parametric pumping. So now we can gain further insight by looking at the Fourier spectra of the magnetization dynamics uh, over different intervals of, of time shown here. So for short, uh, for permalloy, for short times up to let's say uh, 50 nanoseconds, we don't see any, any variations here. So uh, of course, all we see is just the ferromagnetic resonant mode that was initially excited in the simulations. Now, if you look at the time interval from 150 to 200 nanoseconds, that corresponds uh, to the time when, uh, when the amplitude has already dramatically increased. So this, uh, this damping mechanism has, uh, has become effective. So what we see here, is a continuous spectrum of, um, of excitations, not sharp individual peaks that one would expect from, let's say, three or four magnon, resonant magnon scattering processes. So what this means is that this magnon relaxation or magnon interaction mechanism is non-resonant. In other words, all the dynamical modes in the system are excited by this mechanism. And this is consistent with the proposed non-resonant parametric mechanism of, uh, of relaxation. So uh, this was so far, this, this discussion focused on cobalt nickel, but uh, the idea is quite general. And indeed, a similar kind of result was obtained uh, for bismuth dove teak, which was recently showed to exhibit perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And so the experimental geometry that was studied uh, in, uh, in, in this case was just a YIC film uh, uh, with a platinum strip on top. And uh, looking at the frequency of the R oscillation in this system as a function of current, we see that, uh, that it doesn't vary with current. That's the first kind of indication that uh, the demagnetizing effects um, in the system are compensated by the perpendicular anisotropy eliminating uh, nonlinearity. And uh, the spatial mapping actually showed uh, that the system is, uh, emits spin waves with a, finite, uh, with a finite wavelength that is determined by the geometry of uh, the platinum injection strip. So in some ways, uh, this experiment kind of answers the question I posed in the beginning of my talk uh, positively. That is, by uh, eliminating nonlinear uh, spin wave interactions, one can achieve indeed uh, generation of coherent spin waves by, uh, by, spin, uh, by spin current. So um, this data that I have shown to you also demonstrate that uh, high frequency dynamical modes can play a very important role in spin current induced magnetization dynamics. Um, and so what happens with this high frequency mode? This brings me to the last, uh, to the last topic of my talk. So uh, let's, let's go back uh, to the uh, spin torque mechanism and uh, write the expression for the magnum population in some mode with frequency nu as a function of current and temperature. 
So this equation is the same as I have shown to you before, except now we have to include uh, the effect of the dependence of the critical current on the frequency of the mode, which in the simplest approximation is just proportional to the frequency. So now um, let's say at room temperature, uh, the most of the magnet spectrum is degenerate. In other words, uh, KT is much larger than the energy of, of, uh, of uh, at least the low lying magnetic modes. Uh, that, what that means is we can use Rayleigh Jeans law uh, for the magnet populations instead of uh, Bose Einstein distribution. And now this expression, once we put in the Rayleigh Jeans law, this expression can be written in the following form. Uh, it's just KT divided by energy of the mode minus, minus, uh, minus uh, some parameter with the value proportional to the current. And now if you go back and look at this expression, it's the same as Bose-Einstein distribution or uh, in the degenerate limit uh, with the finite chemical potential. So this parameter can be thought of as a current driven effective chemical potential. So now we, have, we arrive at the result that the spin current uh, increases the effective chemical potential of the magnetic system in linear uh, in linear uh, limit that is without even uh, taking into account the interaction among the dynamical modes. Uh, and then we know that in the, Bose, in the Bose system of Bose particles, when the chemical potential becomes equal, in this case, this effective chemical potential becomes equal to the uh, energy of the lowest frequency mode in the, in the system, then uh, the Bose-Einstein condensation occurs in the system. In other words, if nonlinear effects uh, that I have, uh, have discussed in my talk are avoided, then spin-torque mechanism naturally results in the onset of Bose-Einstein condensation, which is just an alternative way of thinking about the coherent, uh, coherent spin current driven magnetization dynamics. And uh, this was predicted a while ago uh, theoretically, and also the, there, is, uh, there is quite a bit of experimental evidence for indeed for the, uh, for the changes of the chemical potential in the magnetic system induced by spin current. But now if you look at the existing paradigms in, uh, in the understanding of Bose-Einstein condensation, the expectation uh, is that the, the, system reach, uh, the system enters a coherent uh, state, that this coherence is, is spontaneous. And of course, for the spin hole and uh, non-local and magnetic multilayer oscillators I have demonstrated to you so far, uh, of course, uh, these conditions are satisfied. However, there is an additional condition. The question is whether uh, the, the states can be described thermodynamically. And the problem here is, of course, that the, the spin current drives the magnon distribution in, into a strongly non-equilibrium state. And uh, it is not obvious whether this state can be described thermodynamically. This is the question that we set out to answer in, in this experiment that I'll describe to you now. So the issue that one needs to deal with is the following. Uh, if you take just a typical, uh, typical spin wave uh, dispersion, I'm showing here for five nanometer uh, thick thermoloid, then uh, there is a maximum accessible wave vector of spin waves due to the spectroscopic limitations of BLS. And as a consequence, the accessible spectral range is quite narrow. And uh, uh, it, it, is, it is necessary to have access to, to large spectral range to try to, to understand whether the spin current driven magnet distribution can be described thermodynamically. So we, we are able to kind of partially alleviate this issue by, the, by using the following geometry. Here we use, uh, we use a permalloy strip that is magnetized along the strip and with thickness larger than the, 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 uh, the magnetic materials that I have discussed so far, 10 nanometers. 
And uh, what this achieves, I won't go into details, but what this achieves is uh, a strong dispersion of the spin wave spectrum such that with the same limitation in terms of the wave vectors, somewhere here around 25, uh, 25 micrometer minus one, we gain access to much wider spectral range as shown here. This is, this is experimental data at zero current. And now when we apply uh, electrical current to the, uh, to the structure, again, it's driven by the spin orbit torque, then we see uh, an enhancement of the fluctuations. But you can notice here in this graph that the enhancement is much larger uh, at smaller frequencies than at higher frequencies. And so this provides some, we can already see that even, even from this data, that they provide some uh, spectrally resolved information about the magnet distribution uh, driven by the spin current. So we can perform more quantitative analysis as follows. If you consider uh, the less intensity, um, uh, it's, it, it can be written as a product of the sensitivity weighted by the uh, sensitivity weighted spectral density of magnet states multiplied by the magnet distribution. So we can write at zero current, we can write really genes law for the uh, for the magnet distribution. At finite current, we can assume uh, that the distribution can be described by some effective temperature that does need to be equal to the experimental temperature. And also by some chemical potential that is not, not necessarily zero as it is in equilibrium. And now if you write the ratio of the BLS intensities at finite current and at zero current, then we see that this sensitivity uh, uh, weighted uh, spectral density, which we don't know, cancels out. And so what we get is just the ratio of the magnet distribution at finite current divided by the equilibrium magnet distribution. And we know what this distribution is. This allows us to extract the magnet distribution at finite current. So what we obtain in this expression that we can use for fitting the data with just two fitting parameters. One of them is the effective temperature Another is the effective chemical potential. And now I'm, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I just want to summarize briefly uh, the analysis. So if you take uh, the data at different values of current, it turns out that they can be fitted quite nicely with this distribution. And then we obtain the effective temperature, which, is in the, uh, which turns out to be independent of current. And, uh, and then the effective chemical potential that linearly varies with current. Here, if it, uh, if it became equal to the frequency, well, properly normalized to the frequency uh, of the lowest frequency state, that would signify Bose-Einstein condensation. Well, it doesn't happen in the system because of the nonlinear mechanisms that I described to you before, but nevertheless, what these results confirm is that at least for this system, the, uh, the effective thermodynamic dis description of spin current driven magnet distribution is uh, justified. Now, I think I ran out of time. So let me just uh, skip this slide. Uh, I just wanted to show you our recent progress in, uh, in expanding the, the, the accessible spectral range of spin waves by using, uh, by using uh, light confinement that was done in pursuit of further understanding of the relationship between uh, thermodynamics of magnets and spin current driven phenomena. And uh, this is the summary of my talk that again, uh, I think you can read and I'll, I'll skip, uh, I'll, I'll skip um, spelling it out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sergey, for your nice talk. Um, we can use the uh, uh, reactions panel to uh, to applaud the speaker at this time. So we are now ready to take questions. If you have a question, please use the raise hand feature that you can find in the nonverbal feedback panel under participants. So please don't wait for the previous question to be answered. Just raise your hand if you have a question. And uh, when you ask a question, feel free to turn on your camera if you don't mind it appearing on the recording. 
Um, so do we have any questions in Zoom? Uh, Shen, please go ahead. All right. Uh, hi, Sergei. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, my question is actually regarding to your uh, introduction. You said that the motivation to do this study is uh, because of optical computing with the advantage that it's uh, very fast. But uh, uh, most of the spin waves that have been studied so far are still at the gigahertz frequency. Uh, we know that magnons and spin waves can go to high, high frequency, but that requires us to go to higher K or shorter wavelengths. Can you comment on the status of in that direction and uh, like the uh, or future direction of that uh, of that aspect? Well, yeah, I mean that's a very good question. Of course, uh, uh, this is kind of a proof proof of principle work that shows how one can avoid one of the issues or some of the issues that arise on this path, right? Uh, so the question is, if you are trying to, if you are trying to develop fast, uh, fast devices based on spin waves, then of course your spin waves need to be a higher frequency as well. So uh, one of the kind of directions that have been very active and have been discussed also in this seminar series is anti-ferromagnetic, uh, anti-ferromagnetic spintronics. I guess it's in, in, in infancy at the moment. Uh, so talking about anti-ferromagnetic magnonics may be premature, but it's kind of one of the uh, possible solutions to the, to the issue of frequency. Uh, another, and, and anti-ferromagnets, of course, they're natural anti-ferromagnets, but also there are fairy magnets, which are kind of in between in, in, in some sense. And there are artificial anti-ferromagnets where the frequency is also, the characteristic frequency can be increased. So I, I would not claim, if you ask me, I wouldn't claim that these are, these are kind of ready answers that one just needs to go out and implement or whether uh, these are unsurmountable kind of challenges and uh, uh, you know, gigahertz frequency is, uh, is, is all one can uh, practically achieve. Thank you. Dr. Kent, your next question, please. Yes, thank you for this very, very interesting talk. And also I appreciate your uh, physical uh, description. It was really, really nice. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this related to coherence. So you showed, you know, basically that you can great, create these populations of magnons that are below the uh, spin wave, in the spin wave gap, you could say. Uh, but how do you address the question of basically the coherence and whether the phase is a well-defined uh, quantity in those, in, in, in those experiments or in, 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 in your models? Well, the models were kind of, thanks for the question, Andy, first of all. And uh, it's a very good question. And uh, you're, in some ways, I mean, it implies that uh, the, the measurements that I have shown to you give, uh, does not give uh, kind of uh, significant insight into how coherent those dynamical states are. And I guess we kind of know partial answer to some of these questions for some of the systems that I have shown to you. Uh, for example, if you take a nanogap uh, spin hole nanoscillator, it was, uh, it was later shown by, uh, by higher resolution spectroscopic measurements because phase is ultimately also related to the spectral, just the spectral properties. Uh, there are more intricate ways to study what happens to the phase, but to the lowest approximation, uh, it is related to the spectral, uh, spectral width, right? Uh, and so there, there, there are follow-up studies where that showed that, for example, at room temperature, with just a nanogap spin hole oscillator, one cannot achieve uh, highly coherent uh, single mode oscillations. That, that does happen at low temperatures. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that this system is intrinsic. Uh, there, is, there is an intrinsic mechanism that results in onset of a secondary mode. And uh, this, this, this mode is basically stabilized by the dipolar field of the primary mode. The primary mode, it kind of resides in this nonlinear potential well, but just having that primary mode also, uh, it doesn't, basically it doesn't fill that whole well. It's not exactly like uh, SP kind of mm -hmm. uh, D, et cetera, but still 
Uh, so it basically creates the possibility for a secondary mode, and that's just an inherent to this geometry. It is not an artifact of, of, of some, some details. And so as a consequence, at room temperature, even though we see, uh, one sees in BLS measurements, one sees uh, a large intensity, uh, lar a large intensity peak, that is not reflective of the fact that at room temperature, this, the systems are not, are not coherent, right? Mm -hmm. So coherence, uh, yep. coherence is related. Uh, there are obviously multiple contributions to decoherence and to, to phase fluctuations. So uh, one of the issues is just thermal fluctuations. That is basically like that's something that you cannot, uh, you have to deal with. You cannot avoid it, right? And mm -hmm. so for nanoscale systems, there is a simple relationship between the volume, the magnetic volume and the thermal decoherence, right? That is aside from the issue with the, with the multiple mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results that I showed to you, that's what, what makes the results that I showed to you in the last part of my talk particularly exciting for me, is that if one can excite uh, at least microscopic instead of nanoscale regions, but microscopic regions uh, of magnetic systems, then that allows one to, to minimize the thermal contribution. That's kind of a must mm -hmm. in some sense, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that it's single mode oscillation. Uh, and then, then there is another contribution, uh, you know, you have worked quite extensively on this also, is nonlinearity, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As soon as the system is nonlinear, then amplitude fluctuations become coupled to phase fluctuations, mm -hmm. uh, right? And so that's another kind of angle uh, at, uh, that I would, I would that I would say makes this kind of systems with compensated uh, and isotopy particularly attractive because uh, there the nonlinearity is, is, is minimized. And so mm -hmm. that, kind of, that kind of gives one, you know, hope to, to achieve the levels of coherence that, that simply cannot be just based because of the fundamental limitations cannot be achieved in nonlinear nanoscale systems. I know that the original motivation for a lot of work on spin, uh, spin torque driven oscillators what the, was that they're nonlinear and therefore they're tunable. But it, turned, it seems that there is more liability that comes with nonlinearity than benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if this is like, a, th th this was a little bit of a rant, but I hope that I at least answered part, some of your questions. No, you hit a lot of the key points. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Twitch. Um, BLS cannot be implemented in a real device on a chip. Uh, is it possible to detect a spin wave electrically in a nanoscale device, for example, using an MTJ? Well, uh, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, but here's the problem. We are talking about, I guess, low amplitude spin waves, if you want to have like high efficiency devices, then it would be either low amplitude spin wave or maybe at the level of single magnets. And that's where kind of the problem is. Uh, with, you know, there, is no problem with, uh, there is no problem with detecting large amplitude spin waves, even with, uh, with uh, GMR structures, with tunnel junctions, or even AMR. And this is what some of our work has been, and, uh, and I know some others uh, that are on this, uh, that are in the audience of the seminar have been actually doing is uh, detecting is detecting large amplitude spin waves, uh, let's say generated by by uh, a spin torque. One can also do, uh, perform do inductive uh, measurements. That's what you know the community, the the spin wave and the magnetic community uh, has been doing for decades. Uh, but again, the question is. Uh, what, are, what is the sensitivity limit for this kind of techniques uh, for them to become practical in terms of the, the minimal amplitude or intensity of spin waves? Okay, thank you. Um, are there any further questions in Zoom or Twitch? Um, let me uh, ask a question. Um, Sorry, sorry, Keo. I didn't know how where to type it in time, but can I ask a question? Uh, without yes, type please, it, having typed it. Please use the raise hand feature. 
Uh, yeah, okay, uh, right, reaction. Oh, okay, sorry, too, too many buttons, too many freedom. Uh, too I much think it's okay, it's already, it's, I, think, I think we should okay. just go ahead. So, so uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Keo, but um, I have an elephant in my head. It's not in the room, but it's in my head. Uh, since you mentioned earlier on uh, these two fundamental works by Berger and uh, the same year, 1996, by Slonczewski, I kind of remember more of Berger's uh, piece. And so uh, the elephant in my head is he coined the term Swazer back then. So all the time you're talking about coherence, it's like the Swazer is on the back of my mind. And uh, then there are other, other, other implications probably in my question, but what do you think about the Swazer? Uh, well, related to your work, not generally, like, it's in the background. He himself says, oh, look at the process he describes. This is just like essentially a solid state injection laser. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, all the time you have these nonlinear things happening in, in your problems, but you're kind of conservative. Uh, I guess the whole community is conservative because I don't think Swayze flew. Uh, I hardly hear anyone mentioning the Swayze. So, but, but what's your take since you're in, in the midst of this? Well, I'm not, I, well, my, um, first of all, I appreciate uh, that you read carefully Bourget's work because I don't, you know, my sense is that a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, found uh, Slanchevsky's work uh, easier to read and, uh, and then they, they didn't really bother with Bourget as a consequence. Right. He's a hard read uh, and uh, the thing is, so uh, there is this pretty extensive literature at this point uh, on the distinction and the crossover between, uh, between lasing and Bose-Einstein condensation. So lasing, uh, in, in, in lasing, of course, your bosonic field is in, in strongly non-equilibrium uh, state. Uh, it's a driven non-equilibrium system, strongly non-equilibrium system. Uh, in, uh, in these systems, it turns out one of the kind of conclusions that one can make from my talk that Bose-Einstein condensation, while not necessarily universal description, because ultimately, you know, for example, if you are emitting spin waves, uh, that's not Bose-Einstein condensate. If the spin wave, because the spin wave, propagating spin wave is is by default not at the bottom of the spin wave, uh, spin wave spectrum. Uh, so uh, Bose-Einstein condensation is much closer to what is happening to, uh, as, uh, than lasing, right? So one needs to have some kind of, so what, what makes lasing possible? It's certain selection rules that pre de 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 define, determine, select out only very few uh, uh, scattering amplitudes resulting in the generation of only a, a, a few modes, dynamical modes. And this is possible with, with, with spin torque. It's just not something that people have worked out so far. Uh, so, I mean, you can, of course, you can start, by, start out by creating cavities, magnet cavities that, uh, that somehow will quantize spectrum. Of course, nanomagnets are those cavities to the, to the first approximation, but one perhaps can think more about it and try to come up with better cavities if you want. But then there is a second side to it. That is the matrix elements. That is what particular modes are excited. And lasers, of course, it's the energy conservation uh, that, that defines those modes uh, that are excited. You know, the simplest example, of course, you take just, uh, just uh, uh, a semiconductor laser, right? It's the gap that will define the lasing frequency. Right, that's the energy of the injected carriers. And so it turns out with spin, to, with spin transfer, one can at least in principle, try to do something like this as well. Uh, so, but to achieve this, one needs to think carefully about how energy comes into play, how quantum energy comes into play in these processes. And that's something that the community has not been doing. We have posted a paper on archive that uh, that Branislav Nikolic mentioned in his talk about quantum contributions to spin transfer. And this paper shows that indeed 
energy conservation does limit the type the modes that are excited in the spin transfer process. It's just it's not as clean as in let's say semiconductor devices or in uh, in other types of uh, lasers. And uh, one one just would need to carefully design uh, the devices to achieve something like this. I'm not sure if it's an answer to your question. Again, I felt like I was rambling. No, uh, it, uh, the, the thing is, if I may just continue this uh, a little bit, you, you probably know better than I do, but you remember how Democrito had a hard time persuading the others that uh, the rest of the world, uh, that uh, the BC of magnons is actual BC of magnons, but then of course you would agree that it's also non-equilibrium. You have to pump magnons all the time to, to have a condensate. So, uh, I mean, all these things are related. Uh, Right. Uh, somehow. Well, actually, uh, I, I actually, you're talking about pumping. Just, just, just to kind of complete your sentence, if you wish, uh, you're talking about pumping. As, of course, it's it's a lossy system, so you need to pump. You need to pump energy into it to maintain the condensate. But that's not the biggest issue with Bose-Einstein condensate of magnets. The biggest issue is as soon as the system is driven and lossy, uh, well, the, you you ha you have interactions in the magnetic system that will relax it towards true equilibrium. And true equilibrium is equilibrium of chemical potential equal to zero, not finite chemical potential. So to achieve both ions and condensation of magnets, you need to somehow in, enhance certain nonlinear interactions that will uh, allow uh, this thermalization with finite chemical potential, but suppress others that would relax the system towards uh, mu equal to zero. That's right. a bigger constraint than, than, than energy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not arguing about anything except that uh, you also do have this effective chemical potential in these formulas that uh, actually one of them looks too much like stoner enhancing factor, but that's a different story. So you also have, you're looking for an effective explanation in terms of, of a chemical potential, right? So it, it, again, it's just similar to this other situation. I'll, I'll just throw the last thing and I'll, I'll, uh, then I'll shut up. So back in the day, there was this quantum optician who then became more interested in um, uh, microscopic uh, phenomena. You remember him, Herman Haken. And so he was the one who actually was discussing a laser genera the generation, laser generation, slightly above the threshold in terms of, of this emergent uh, order parameter. Of course, there were amplitudes that were involved all that. So I'm just throwing this last bit in this big, <laughs> very overarching idea of bose einstein but in this case of phase transitions. So the guy was making essentially this big over, uh, crossover in the description of lasing in terms of uh, he didn't say about Einstein condensation, I think. He was talking about phase transitions, and I think they were second order. He was introducing all the parameter precisely slightly above the threshold. A anyway, so, but all these things are rather nonlinear, uh, and maybe that's, that's it. At the end of the day, maybe that's the common feature. Yeah, I I'm sorry, I'm just throwing in comments here. No questions, okay, no critique. Bianco, Very nice talk. Let's, let's leave this for further discussion. I don't see any more questions. So let's uh, thank Professor Rajan again.